Welcome to Independent Living Bullion's weekly market wrap podcast, helping precious metals investors during these treacherous times. And now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the fastest growing precious metals dealer in America, Independent Living Bullion. This is Mike Leeson with Independent Living Bullion, and it is my privilege now to be joined by our friend and colleague, David Morgan, editor of the renowned Money, Metals, and Mining newsletter, to get his thoughts on what has been a rather tumultuous year so far for precious metals investors. David, welcome back, and thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Mike. Well, here we are five months into the year, and many gold and silver bulls have been rather frustrated by the market action that we've been seeing uh, so far, not just in 2013, but going back some 24 months now. Uh, For the year, silver's down close to 25%, gold's off nearly 18%. Meanwhile, unless I'm missing something, we haven't really seen any change whatsoever in the fundamental reasons for why someone would want to own precious metals. Uh, So how does one make sense of all the negative price action in the metals markets? Because we've seen nothing to indicate a slowing to the currency destructive measures by all the central banks. Well, I think the answer is, you know, how do you reconcile this as investors? And the answer is investors. I mean, an investor has a long-term macro picture, and they have power of their conviction. Basically, uh, Jim Poplav on the Financial Sense News Hour, myself, many, many years ago, uh, early 2000s, talked about a, the perfect investor. We didn't use that exact word, but the idea was if you had bought into uh, Japan and from uh, 1980 to 1990 and just bought and held through all the ups and downs, you would have made a massive amount of money. If you'd redeployed really it into technology in 1990 to 2000 and held that 10 years through the ups and downs, you would have made a massive amount of money. And we suggested that if you got into the metals in the early uh, 2000s and held all the way up through up the uh, ups and downs, uh, you would do very, very well. But the question comes is, you know, is it over? And I, I say absolutely not. The reason I can say that is one had no signs of a top other than the chart, and even that didn't look like much of a top compared to how the metals actually could perform. And the sentiment is low, and there was such little participation. So we are still in an attitude that, you know, maybe this is it. It's really not in my view. So basically you want to hold all the way up and not get shaken out of the bull market. And this was something similar that took place in the last bull market. We had gold go from the uh, set price of uh, near 35 all the way up to almost 200, down to 100. It took almost three years before that recovery from the high of just under 200 to come back up to 200 again. It visited uh, a little over 100 and then made its way back. And that was a long, long time relative to the amount of the you know market that had taken place thus far and many were convinced that the bull market was over and once it got back to the high many were convinced it was a double top and yet that's not what happened what happened was the market took off from that roughly 200 figure all the way to 850 so it quadrupled <coughs> or quadrupled rather from that point and I think we're going to do something similar here. But uh, basically, you've got to have the power to hold, and you're not getting new buyers. Yeah, patience is certainly going to be, you know, I think a good thing for people in the long run here. Don't lose your, your conviction. Now, now, the last time we had you on the podcast, you probably gave one of the best and most honest answers I've heard on the idea of manipulation of the precious metals markets, and you talked about the working group on financial markets and their edict to keep things under control, I guess, for lack of a better word. But regardless of their efforts, you mentioned that the overall trend can't be manipulated despite uh, what they might achieve in the short run. Uh, Now, it seems like they've maybe ratcheted up those uh, measures here recently. So do you think the main purpose is maybe to shake out people to the point that gold and silver are no longer viewed as safe havens? And if that is the case and one of their main goals, do you think it's working? Because obviously there's been a huge amount of buying in the physical markets to suggest that Maybe it isn't shaking the confidence of the key players. Yeah, great question. My opinion is is that the working group on financial markets is used to instill confidence in certain markets, primarily the debt markets, which means the bond market, and secondly, the stock market. These are what the establishment is concerned with. They want uh, most investors to be 
taken by the bond market or the stock market. The Working Group on Financial Markets was formed after the 1987 stock market crash because at that time the quote-unquote circuit breakers that were in place did not work. And we got this huge waterfall decline and a, and a big big decline. And in fact, I was I was involved in the market at that time as I've been involved in markets for a very long time. And it was quite, quite scary. So the Working Group on Financial Markets was established so that this couldn't happen again. And I think uh, what you stated, Mike, is uh, part of the idea that if they get the establishment to give market indicators for the stock market and the bond market that look good, then a lot of these people that are short-term oriented, that were in the metals, let's say, not that long ago, are easily convinced to go for the fast buck, which means to dump the gold and silver markets, the ETFs, anything associated with it, and move into the stock market. And that's what we're seeing right now. It's fairly not uh, convinced that there's any manipulation of markets. I suggest anyone listening to this go to the go to Google or any search engine and verify what I'm saying. Look up the 1987 stock market crash, or better yet, look up uh, the Working Group on Financial Markets. How much longer do you expect it to to go on? Uh, and ultimately, do you, what do you think the tipping point will be to bring a shift from where we have, say, the paper market, you know, sets the price for the physical market, and, and what sort of specific uh, I think should investors be looking for as signals of a trend change in, in that dynamic of the paper market setting the price for the physical? Well, let me answer that kind of in reverse. Well, first of all, we're seeing several facts around the gold market that the physical markets are breaking down. Germany being primary is not being able to receive its gold for seven years. I mean, this is ridiculous. That's what the Federal Reserve told them. Then we have this Dutch bank that uh, had physical gold for their clients, and they came out recently and said, nope, you have to settle in cash, not physical. Additionally, there's tons of anecdotal evidence all over the Internet on sites that are frequented by gold and silver people that have uh, different accounts of not being able to get gold, uh, basically that they've already bought, paid for, stored, etc., uh, they're getting non-deliveries and they're getting cash settlements. So objectively, if you discount everything I've said, you still have Germany. And so that is an irrefutable fact. So that alone is pretty loud and very clear that there's something going on in the physical gold market. If there weren't any problems in physical delivery, then Germany would obviously be getting its gold here very quickly. I expect the paper markets, though, to continue through probably the end of 2013 and probably through 2014. We continue to see big differentials between the retail price and the commercial bar price. But as long as the commercial bars can be delivered in a somewhat timely manner, the paper markets will maintain basic credibility. Once that breaks down, then we know. That's the point. And in the meantime, lots of gold is coming off the COMAX and out of the gold ETFs. So I could be wrong on my look of, you know, another couple of years. Uh, perhaps we're going to see this gold delivery problem sooner than later. But that's what we'll know. We'll know when, and it will not be called a default. There'll be some lame excuse coming out of the mainstream press. But basically what it will amount to is another Germany type of situation. It might be a big hedge fund. It might be uh, Paulson buying more gold, one of these huge fund managers, David Ihorn, or one of these types, uh, Carl, Carl Bass. I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, no one else does. But it could be something like that. It could be Sprott that says, you know, give me this much gold and uh, taking it off of, you know, a major bank, a major bullion bank, and a major bullion bank can't access it in time. And they have to delay delivery. And I think that's, that's going to be the tipping point. Looking back at again some of the fundamental drivers for precious metals and why it's uh, you know likely going to be a good asset moving forward here as we go throughout this decade. Uh, now we've got the Federal Reserve maybe hinting at the end of QE. If you believe it or not, I, I tend to uh, not uh, put any water in what uh, Bernanke says. But you know, it looks like the U.S. is currently falling behind here in the race to devalue. What do you expect the Fed to be doing as a reaction to that? And, and when will they uh, make some sort of a, a, a new measure that's going to be very inflationary? Uh, another great question. Let me just state this is my opinion. I think they're using Japan as a test case. 
uh, there's already strong indications that the Japanese government bond market is in trouble. I mean, you've already seen volatility in interest rates in Japanese government bonds that are unprecedented. And that's when they're just getting started this 222 policy. I mean, this is absolute, complete, and total 100% insanity. I mean, this 222 policy will want to double the monetary base. That means the cash market. That is the amount of printed money. They want to generate 2% inflation. They want to do it within two years. If that is a signal to anybody that's ever studied even slightly what happens to a paper fiat system, uh, then, then they don't understand. I mean, now people that don't have any uh, education on this topic, they're oblivious to it, which is probably 98% of the population. But nonetheless, the facts are right in front of us. So I think the Fed is looking at Now, the debt markets that exist, basically the U.S. debt market is the biggest, but Japan is not that far behind. The debt market of Japan is huge. So I think that maybe, this is again opinion, the Fed is looking ahead to see what is going to happen in the Japanese debt markets and see how the reaction, how the markets taper it over, what they do uh, as an indicator for mu- how much more they can get, a- you know, get away with. But again, that's how I see it. Regardless of my opinion, uh, the facts remain that Jap- the Japanese have taken a step here into absolute financial suicide slash insanity. If you look at uh, gold and yen terms, I know it hit an all-time high uh, last month, shortly before that uh, that big price correction that we saw mid-month. But uh, yeah, Japan is a, is an interesting test case, and it's the world's third biggest economy, so it's it's definitely matters quite a bit on the global scale. Uh, looking at uh, one of the metals here, I wanted to speak to you about uh, palladium has been holding up quite well in 2013, despite weakness in the other metals. You know, year to date, it's up about seven percent, and it's held above 700 quite consistently here. Now, obviously, the dynamics for any of the platinum group metals are a bit different than for gold or silver, and palladium is more of an industrial metal than a monetary metal. But I've heard it said that the PGMs often lead the way for silver, and you know we haven't really seen that despite palladium's surge. So is that theory kind of thrown out the window, or, or do you think that eventually the strength in palladium will manifest itself in the more well-known precious metals, meaning silver and gold? I was taught, when I started trading futures very seriously, my broker was very good in the metals. And he taught me that whites leave the gold, leave the yellow is the way he stated it. And I've witnessed that over the years. Um, obviously, I agree with you, Mike, that you really can't look at platinum palladium as monetary metals. The market doesn't. They're very, very small. So if there's any place you could really manipulate a market from the long side, it would be the platinum group metals. Having said that, uh, it is a, it has been a precursor in the past, and I think it still has merit. But as you all know, as I just said, it really isn't considered monet, not much of a monetary role. But if we look back at history, again, I love dealing with facts, and we see where Ford Motor Company bought a billion dollars worth of physical palladium for the supply chain for the color converters. The price went crazy, and the futures market ceased to function, really. The reason I say it ceased to function is at the top of the market, you, first of all, as it was going up to uh, over a thousand dollars an ounce, and gold at the time was just in the hundreds of dollars per ounce. It went well over the gold price at that time. You had to put up more than the full cash price to stay in the futures market. Well, then what's the benefit of the futures market? You have to put up more than the cash price at the top of the market. You had to put up double the cash price to stay in the futures market. That's how absurd. So the futures market totally broke down. It says Jimson Paris talked about in um, the gold and silver markets, particularly the gold market, then when the margin requirements are basically the cash price, then you don't have a futures market. And I didn't mention that in your previous question, but I think it, uh, I want to emphasize that now because that's another surefire indicator that there is no futures market. It said, oh, we got a futures market, but the uh, volatility in gold is so high that uh, all I did put the full cash price. Well, now you have a cash market, not a futures market. So to my thinking, this still is a precursor, and it's also a precursor to probably what will take place in the silver market, although it certainly could happen in the gold market as well. Your current thinking on prices in the medium to longer term, has is, is that changed any with, uh, with the recent events and the declines that we've seen here recently? Is, is your outlook uh, still uh, bullish? Well, I've been both bullish and somewhat bearish. I mean, I'm not a perma bull. I mean, I am for the long term, and I'll call the top when I see it. If I see it, and I trust I will get close. But um, as far as the short term is concerned, I put out a video Monday to our members only for the very short term, 
and let's just say I'm bullish, I'm looking for a rally in the June, I'm not going to mention the exact time or the price I'm looking for, but I did do that, and that's you know what I get paid for for part of the service. Basically, we're long-term investors, but we do trade part of the portfolio, and I do like to put a trade on from time to time, and I just updated everybody on that. Long-term, uh, you're still uh, thinking we're going to see things moving a lot higher, I take it? Well, I, I do allow myself the option to adjust my thinking as the market reveals more. I mean, no one's perfect in this business. I have said for the last, I think, several weeks, if not a few months, that, uh, you know, take about two years for the silver market to work off that uh, the parabolic high that we saw May 1st, 2011, or the end of April 2011. Uh, it's obviously been two years and a few days right now. I think we're going to probably see a relief rally here, as I just mentioned, and we're probably going to come back down into maybe the August time frame, which is historically true for gold and silver. And then we're going to start up in September. So I think by the end of the year, we'll be past the breakdown area, which for gold was roughly 1550 and for silver 26. I think we'll be above both those levels for both metals. And then I think 2014 is going to be a rebuilding year where interest comes back into the precious metals markets. And I will see an acceleration in my view, like we just like we saw in the last market, probably not as dramatic as we saw in the 70s to 1980 market, where we saw these huge moves in a very very short amount of time. I'm I already gave a lecture up in uh, British Columbia that I'll be going back to here uh, this weekend about 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time for the silver market. And I've been saying that for a while, it's something that Jeff Christian had mentioned early on in this bull market, and I never actually did the math. It's quite simple to do, and I did look at it recently, I mean, you know, about a year ago when I made this speech, and it turned out that's almost exactly what it is. It was like 87.5% of the move came in the last, like, 7% of the time. So I'm going to say it's going to be exactly a repeat. What I am suggesting strongly is that it will accelerate. You'll see these drastic moves up, and uh, people will be coming on board late rather than now when it should be accumulating. Yeah, that's great advice and, and good insight. Well, David, thanks for your time, as always, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again down the road, perhaps a bit more regularly than we have been. Uh, now, before we go, you alluded to it a moment ago, an upcoming speaking engagement. Let's see, this Monday, May 27th, at the World Resource Investment Conference in British Columbia at 4.30, I believe, is when you're going to be speaking. And for those who are going to check that out, uh, what can they expect to hear from you? Well, it's over the move ahead. That's the name of the speech. And it is the second day, the 27th at 4.30 in the main auditorium. And if you want more information, just go to my website, silver-investor.com. It's right at the top, and there's a couple of uh, URLs you can click to register for the event. Well, excellent. And having uh, seen you speak before, I can say that it's uh, sure to be both informative and entertaining as well. So anyone checking it out will not be disappointed. Well, that will do it for this week's Market Wrap. Thanks again to David Morgan for joining us. Don't forget to tune in next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Gleason with Independent Living Bullion. Thanks for listening, and have a great Memorial Day weekend, everybody. 